Hello and welcome. Today I will be showing you the trebuchet that I have built, its history, manufacturing process, and function. So I suppose we should start with the history of the trebuchet, its types and intended function. Firstly, the word originates from the old French word trebuchet, meaning to overthrow or fall over. This word has been co-opted into a broad term referring to siege engines with a rotating arm that pivots on an axle. The question you may all be asking when you see my trebuchet, aside from why on earth did you spend two years building an obsolete artillery piece, may be where is the counterweight? You're probably all used to seeing images of trebuchets where the energy used to launch the projectile comes from the gravitational potential energy created by raising up a weight on one end of the fulcrum, which is dropped, thus accelerating the projectile on the other end. While trebuchets like this certainly did exist, they are a later evolution of their smaller scale ancestor, the traction trebuchet. These traction trebuchets seem to first appear in Chinese manuscripts all the way back in the 4th century BC. The first drawings that I could find of them were in the 11th century AD in China, for example from the Wujing Zongyao. This can lead us to believe that the idea existed first in China and then travelled west, as the next chronological depictions of trebuchets appear throughout the Muslim world, and then the Byzantine Empire, and finally in Western Europe by the 12th century AD. The principle for the weapon is the same as any other projectile weapon. I want to kill my enemy with a rock, but he's over there. Except this time, not only is the enemy over there, he is also behind a wall, and the rock is too large to throw. What we can glean from manuscripts such as the Machia Jowski Bible and the Liber Ad Honorum Augusti, or textual sources such as the Parliament Rolls of England or Bellafortis, is that these engines were designed to get projectiles through or over walls, depending on their size, and to cause damage to all manner of targets from individuals to buildings and defensive structures. All in all, they were very versatile machines. Their versatility is drawn from the engineering principles behind them. A trebuchet uses a fulcrum, whereby a large amount of force spread over a short distance on one end of the fulcrum can be transferred to a large amount of rotational velocity, launching a projectile with a large amount of momentum behind it, as well as at great speed on the other end. Traction trebuchets use this principle to achieve great versatility and range, as one can utilize the cumulative strength of any desired quantity of men to put energy into the projectile. Now seems like as good as time as any to move on to my design, its original intended purpose, and how I made it. The whole project came about after a tree that was undermining our house was felled. This momentous occasion rekindled a dream that my father and I had had of building a trebuchet. Considering that no original artifacts survived, we began consulting the very helpful people of Historia Normanis, which is a great reenactment group of the 11th and 12th century, which has made several siege engines of its own. We also consulted surviving manuscripts from the 12th and 13th century, which gave us pictorial sources for these engines of warfare. We drew up a plan and got to work. We wanted to use historical methods, and we also wanted this siege engine to be easily stored, dismantled, and transported. So we decided to design it using dry jointing with pegged mortise and tenon joints. Firstly, we carved out the mortises in two 4x8, eight, 8 foot long lengths of oak. These two lengths of oak were joined together by four 4x4, four 4, 5 foot long spaces, which held the base of the frame together at 4 feet apart. These had square pegs holding the tenons in their through mortises firmly. Upright beams were then made, with struts on either side holding them securely, and another strut holding them apart from each other stably. The diagonal struts and upright beams were pegged in place in blind mortises with round tapered pegs. Finally, with the frame being complete, the throwing arm is placed on the axle, which is a 2-inch iron bar fitting through two holes in the top of the upright support beams. The main throwing arm is made from a pine tree trunk, which was the one we felled which sparked this project in the first place. It is then jointed to some support beams as such, which will hold the ropes that we'll pull down on. There is also an iron bracket fitted to the end with a peg that can hold the sling. Rather brashly, we decided to use solid English oak for the frame, which involved several added days of chiseling and drilling through one of the hardest and heaviest native trees known to England. However, this gave us the advantage of a heavy base, which weighed in at about half a ton, meaning that if the action encountered any friction, the machine wouldn't go flying.
Here you can see us carrying the parts of the trebuchet from where they have lived in storage for five months. Their condition after this time is also a testament to Oak, as there were minimal adjustments needed to account for the warpage that they suffered. The whole machine can be assembled by only two people in around an hour and a half, but with more people I'm sure it will be quicker. We created the whole piece using hand tools, chisels, drills, handsaws, etc. Although I'm afraid we took no videos of the process as we started this project long before I planned to put anything on YouTube, so I hope this video of us putting it up will do the trick. Once the beam goes in and all ropes are attached, the trebuchet will be ready to launch. After some warpage, however, the two upright beams were not allowing for proper fitting of the axle, so we used an old medieval torsion technique to bring them together, which may or may not be hinting at a future project of siege weaponry. After donning some medieval-esque garb, I coerced my family to join me in pulling the ropes. According to the landowner, we could only launch projectiles that wouldn't damage the ground, hence water balloons. Although, they are comparable in size and weight to some types of stone, so range is shown as somewhat accurate.
With only four of us pulling, we achieved a range of approximately 50 meters, with a huge arc. We can change the angle of release of the sling, but this angle allows for some impressive height to arc over a castle wall, for instance. Thanks to these troubling times, the operational effectiveness and efficiency of the machine is greatly reduced compared to the crew of eight or more we intend to use when life goes back to normal. After shooting the trebuchet for some time, it was time to take the whole thing down. I hope you've enjoyed watching us shoot it, but now it's time to put it away and you can see how it all comes apart, which might give you a bit more insight into how it all went together in the first place. It's great fun to use this machine, and once all goes back to normal, I'll be hoping to use it at events, launching all manner of projectiles with a much larger crew. So stay tuned for more videos concerning siege weaponry. Thanks for watching.